We're coming back from um, Norway and we're going to come to Australia. Um, just before we go on, some people wanted to know the hashtag for tweeting. So it's uh, hash leaders, spelled L-E-A-D-R-S, one three. It's not misspelled, it's like, you know, hashtag stuff. <laughs> just how it rolls. Okay. Um, that was fascinating from our panellists from Norway. It was just need to talk about how we can get um, uh, shared political views uh, on children. So that will be something that we can really ask about. Um, it's my great privilege now to introduce um, our three Australian panellists who are both friends and colleagues of mine, so I feel very um, very happy to be introducing them. <coughs> and they've got amazing intellect, so here we go. We're going to start with Kay Colmer. Kay is the CEO at Gowrie South Australia. Within her role at Gowrie South Australia, she's pursued the development of integrated services, use of attachment theory, distributed leadership and organisational wide professional learning. Her current research interests are early childhood leadership, curriculum change and professional learning. In 2012, she led the development of the Gowrie SA Advanced Diploma of Community Sector Management for early childhood leaders implementing the National Quality Framework. Since 2010, she has taught in the Graduate Certificate of Education at UniSA and is a member of the South Australian Institute for Educational Leadership. Her doctoral research is exploring the connection between leadership and professional learning for curriculum change in early childhood. Next to Kay is Dorana Wong, and Dorana is a lecturer and doctoral student with the Institute of Early Childhood, Macquarie University. She began her career as an early childhood educator in Singapore, her country of birth. She has worked in kindergartens and childcare centres in both Singapore and Sydney for nearly two decades. Living and working in two cultures has influenced Dorana's teaching and research interests and philosophy of working with children, families and early childhood professionals. Her doctoral research will focus on the role of mentoring and its implications for leadership, pedagogy and practice in early childhood education. And finally to the far right there is Anthony Saman. Anthony is a director of Saman and Slattery, a national consulting and research company. Anthony has a degree in education, a master's qualification in sociology, and is currently completing a PhD investigating the relationship between courage and leadership. He has co-authored a number of books on management and leadership, authored and co-authored book chapters, including a recent chapter on race and identity, and has been an editor and reviewer for education and cultural studies journals. Anthony has recently co-edited a special edition journal on cultural amnesia, loss and sexual identity. Could you please welcome all of our panellists? Hi, good morning. Before I begin, I would like to show my respect and acknowledge the traditional custodians of this land, of elders past and present, on which this land we stand on. Um, a little bit about myself, I'm actually from Singapore, I've been living in Sydney for the last 10-13 um, years. It's been a challenge having two contexts in my mind, two sets of laws, each time I shift between two countries, two ways of being, two ways of um, seeing things. Even in the leadership framework, I have to shift where I am, the role I play and how I go about being the person I am. So this is sort of a sort of a culmination of my two worlds at this point in my life. Um, let's begin. Um, mentoring is a guided and facilitated process involving two or more individuals that have a shared interest in professional learning and development. Now mentoring in early childhood is also seen as a way of developing leadership development. So traditionally, mentoring has been used as a solution strategy to enhance teacher pedagogical practice. Accordingly, what is mentoring and who can be a mentor are important to consider when assessing the veracity of the positive outcomes it claims. Now, mentoring has been conceptualised and implemented in diverse ways within different organisations, professions and cultural contexts. As a process, mentoring may be generally described as a dynamic interpersonal relationship 
involving two or more people. In early childhood, this is often perceived as a peer relationship where a more experienced practitioner provides professional guidance to one or more novice practitioners, either on a one-to-one -one basis or as a group. Now, the differences in meaning and expectations held by the key stakeholders in the mentoring relationship or the mentor and the protégé can also contribute to the inconsistencies of mentoring, of how it's understood and the how it's positioned within a formal leadership framework. According to the OECD, governments today recognise that the quality of early childhood programmes are dependent on the quality of its workforce that is assessed in terms of staff qualifications and participation in ongoing professional learning. Mentoring of both qualified and unqualified teachers has been used as a solution strategy to overcome workplace challenges at times of conflict or, cri or crisis when intervention by someone with authority and experience is required. Mentoring, however, is more than a short-term intrusion in times of high need and can be adopted as a preventive approach as in the case of succession planning, to safeguard against the sudden loss of expertise and to ensure a smooth handover from one leader to another. Now in Australia, for instance, mentoring is now embedded as a leadership responsibility within the national quality framework. In this instance, mentoring of both qualified and unqualified teachers is perceived as a solution strategy to overcome challenges to providing quality programs. Particular attention is placed on staff support and mentoring as aspects of building a capable early childhood workforce. As part of the National Quality Standards, or Element 4.2.2, <laughs> it describes how staff in the team support and mentor each other as key to staff developing and improving their professional skills practice and relationships. So one of the roles of the educational leader is to guide other educators in their planning and reflection and mentor colleagues in their implementation practices. Now the extent to which professional qualifications are recognised and valued can also reinforce the alignment between mentoring and the educator's early childhood expertise. Unfortunately, this link is not explicitly endorsed in the Australian policies and also reflects a rather traditional way of doing mentoring as a solution strategy. So before I share some findings from a small research study I conducted in Singapore, let me introduce the country and its context. Singapore is a small, independent nation-state in Southeast Asia, located <coughs> at the southernmost tip of Malaysia we are actually slightly smaller than the size of Canberra. So we are dot on the map. But it comprises largely an immigrant population of 5.4 million. Culturally, Singapore is made up of three main ethnic groups, Chinese, Malay and Indian. The Chinese are a dominant race, making up more than 75% of the residents. In recent years, Singapore has become increasingly cosmopolitan. It is a place where East meets West because of the diversity of cultures and people from all parts of the world. Against the backdrop of a multicultural and cosmopolitan nation, the provision for the early years in Singapore is considerably diverse. In the last decade, more than 50% of women contributed to the country's labour force and the figure is predicted to rise in the years to come. With more women actively encouraged to join the workforce, the demand for preschool provision has become strong, and this is reflected in the increase in demand of out-of-home care and provision for children in the early years. Globalisation has had a profound impact on Singapore, with an increase in migration and also in the recent years, impacted on the early childhood sector. For instance, Singapore received a ranking of 29 out of 45 in an international benchmarking study on early education in 2012. Since the release of the study report, 
There have been many changes implemented to address concerns on availability, affordability and quality of early childhood services, with the government promising a $30 million boost to the sector over the next three years. The term preschool generally, generally refers to childcare centres and kindergartens, and these are available in both the private and public sector. There is a hierarchy of roles guiding the work within each early childhood setting. Typically, there is a principal or similar to a director in Australia, a <laughs> vice principal, a senior teacher, a number of teachers and assistant teachers. In 2010, a new role of mentor teacher was established by a major childcare provider as a professional pathway for career advancement within the early childhood sector. The newly developed mentor teacher role is considered to be a senior role, comparable to the vice principal level without formal staff performance management responsibilities. As part of Singapore's early childhood legislation, only senior teachers with at least three years of teaching experience may serve as mentors to student teachers completing practicum placements. The introduction of this new role of the mentor teacher reflects some similarity to the introduction of the educational leader in Australia. There was very little information provided to clarify the purpose and expectation of this role, the qualification and experience that this person must possess, and little to no proper preparation or professional development to support the new role at its introduction. So in the past decade, globally, little has been studied on mentoring of staff currently working in early childhood settings. There is anecdotal evidence of mentoring that takes place within early childhood setting, settings and more, wide, uh, more broadly in the sector. But most importantly, the stark lack of rigorous research on formal and informal mentoring of early childhood staff makes it difficult to comment on the extent to which mentoring may impact on either children's learning outcomes or the overall quality of the setting and its program. As such, there was also little or no evidence-based evidence of mentoring in early child developments in Singapore to guide the policy and practice. So a small exploratory research study was conducted on a major childcare provider of 100 centres to investigate the nature of the practitioner's perceptions and experiences of mentoring currently occurring in early childhood settings. 155 <coughs> participants from 45 centres responded to a survey. Research-based evidence on mentoring can assist in the articulation and implementation of mentoring practices in early childhood. So my two key research questions explored were, one, what are the perceptions about mentoring held by early child practitioners in Singapore? And two, what are the current practices of mentoring in early childhood settings in Singapore? So these are some of the brief results. <coughs> Out of 155 participants that completed a survey, 59% indicated that their centres currently had a formal mentoring program in place. However, 64% of participants reported that they experienced mentoring at some point during their career. So there is a significant association found between centres that were identified as having a mentoring program in place and the participants who reported to have a mentor. However, it was not evident whether the mentoring relationships were formed within the centre, <coughs> external to the centre, or experienced prior to joining the organisation. Out of the 99 participants who reported having a mentor at some time during their career, a significant relationship was found between the frequencies of contact between the mentor and the mentee, and the success rate each participant reported. So the more frequent the contact occurred, the more successful the participant rated the mentoring experience. And here we are looking at a significance of daily interaction with a mentor. It was also important to see if there was a relationship between participants who had a mentor and the qualifications they had attained in early childhood. A significant relationship was found between a participant having a mentor at some point during their career and the level of qualification. 
The results demonstrated that participants who identified as having successful mentoring experience completed a higher level of qualification, such as a diploma or a degree. There was also a significant association between the participants' years of experience in early childhood and the duration of the mentoring relationships. So participants with less than four years of working experience reported having a mentor for at least six to 12 months. Now, it is important to recognize that the concept of a mentor includes an enmeshment of three dimensions of mentoring. The grey triangle at the center represents both the mentor and the protégé. The overlaps between the three dimensions reflect reciprocity and interdependence. Absence of mutual awareness and understanding of each dimension by the individuals in the mentoring relationship can render the processes to be ineffective and unsatisfactory. So this also highlights the importance of discussing the purposes, expectations, and goals of mentoring early in the relationship and revisit these along the way to minimize potential disharmony. So individual follow-up interviews were conducted with six participants, including principals, teachers, and assistant teachers, to explore a more in-depth view of the mentoring relationship they had experienced. Participant responses reflected the three dimensions of mentoring, and here are just some snippets. All six interviewed stated that it was important that the mentor provided guidance on the teaching practices of their mentee and be a role model who can demonstrate appropriate practice for them. This was especially critical during the early days of employment at the centre, where the mentee <coughs> needed to settle into the culture of the centre and meet the expectations of their job. These were just some comments made. This corresponded with results in the survey when asked to nominate <coughs> key responsibilities of mentors. The top three responsibilities selected were observe staff in daily work and provide feedback, demonstrate effective teaching practice to other staff, and manage staff in fulfilling their job requirements. How the mentoring relationship is established can impact the roles and responsibilities of the mentor. This was evident with the experiences of all the participants interviewed as the main responsibilities of the mentors reflected guiding and modelling effective practice as teachers. In this sense, it can be inferred the mentor played the role of inducting the mentee to the organisation and profession by familiarising the mentee with the work culture and the curriculum expectations of each centre. Modelling good teaching practice was ranked the most important skill a mentor should possess, with listening and clear communication being second and third most important skills. Le Conu recommends two sets of skills she considers to be important in mentoring. Firstly, she positions highly developed interpersonal skills as key in a mentoring relationship. This is because communication involves listening, reflecting, questioning, confirming, describing, challenging and debating, especially within the field of education, where one's own teaching pedagogy and practice continues to evolve through experience over time. The top five qualities a mentor needed to possess were open to ideas, respectful, positive, has integrity, and trustworthy. Salto Manning and Dice, Trobowitz and Wang consider effective mentors to demonstrate commitment and enthusiasm to the learning process, as well as being flexible, patient, and diplomatic. These qualities have been recognized as being critical where successful mentors were seen as having emotional positiveness, being professional, nurturing, collegial, persistent, and helpful. So the results of this really small study indicated that early childhood practitioners in Singapore were most likely to experience a mentor when they worked in a centre with a formal mentor programme. 
Moreover, a significant association was also found where more frequent contact was associated with more successful mentoring relationships. It can be implied that when centres have a formal mentoring programme in place, mentoring relationships could be potentially more successful due to the possibility of frequent contact between the mentor and mentee daily. In this study, however, there were no participants who inferred to informal mentoring, so it makes it difficult to draw conclusions about frequency of contact and satisfaction with mentoring when the mentor and mentee are not employed within the same centre. In September this year, mentoring in early childhood has been in the spotlight in Singapore with the publishing of a YouTube clip by the Singapore Workforce <coughs> Development Authority to highlight the importance of the role of a mentor for a beginning preschool teacher. This video was developed in conjunction with a mentoring starter kit. Now just two weeks ago, this was when I was writing this paper, right? Mm -hmm. Just two weeks ago, the Early Childhood Development Agency or the ECDA, which is like a sequel in Australia, who is the regulatory and developmental authority body for the early child sector, announced that as part of the continuing professional development master plan for the early childhood sector, the roadmap will have a teaching and leadership pathways to cater to the different aspirations of early childhood professionals. So the ECDA will select and groom mentor principals and master teachers to take on mentoring responsibilities that can benefit the whole sector. So what exactly this means is not clear at this stage. They make the announcement first, that's normal. It seems that there will be now two different positions for centre-based mentoring in early childhood settings. So this reflects a hierarchical nature of Singapore society and early childhood services. As you can see, there is no getting away from the beliefs and values underpinning society at large when one is looking at mentoring or education in Singapore. And I'm actually now in the final stages of putting together my touches for my PhD research design, so wish me luck. Thank you. Yeah.